happen. After my near-death experience, I was a mess. I, I, you know, people are like, oh, that's great. You know, you were with God. And, and I'm like, okay, imagine, imagine a baby in its mother's arms as loved as it's ever going to be. And somebody just ripping that baby out of its mother's arms and then throwing it into this hostile environment. That's what it felt like. Welcome to part two in the finale of the incredible near-death experience story with Penny Whitbrot. If you missed part one, you can find a link to the episode in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. And what did you feel? What was the feeling? I just, it was awe. I, I always tell people um, the one thing that I know that I know in my knower is that I am not God. Because a lot of people will have a near-death experience and they're like, oh, we're all God. And I'm like, okay, I don't know that that's what they mean or maybe it, it is hard to put words on it. So I can see where um, it gets rough trying to explain it. But in that moment, I knew that I was not God, that I was just this small speck in the universe that this God for some reason cared about. You know, and he didn't have to. I'm pretty insignificant in the, you know, in the whole scheme of things. But I knew that he was there and I knew that he loved me. And I'm talking loved me like adored me, was thrilled to see me. And I hadn't expected that. I had expected to be overwhelmed and have all those feelings about him. I didn't expect it to come from him first. And there was something about that that just set me off balance. And so I immediately kind of got defensive because I'm like, I could feel him knowing me and it just, the whole thing was really weird. And, uh, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, so Don and I met, we've been together 12 years. I'm, I'll be 52 this year. And when you get together later in life, it's not like when you get together when you're 20 and everything stills where it's supposed to be. The girls are saluting the sun, you know, everything's tight and compact. It's, it's all gone downhill, right? <laughs> After three kids. And, and so you're dating this guy and, you know, guys, for you, those of you who aren't aware, they make all kinds of devices to make us, to get us put together into what you see out and about. That's not what's going on. <laughs> it's scary. And so you're thinking to yourself, for anybody who's dated later in life, you know, at some point I'm going to have to get naked in front of this man and my boobs are going to hit my knees and that's going to be it. That's, he's just going to be like, oh man, I had, I don't know how you pulled that, that mirage off for the... <laughs> whole time we were dating, but I was not <laughs> expecting that. And it's kind of like what it's like when you're in front of God, because, you know, we go to God and we pray and we go to church, but we're not being real. You know, there's a certain amount of things you're willing to confess or willing to admit, or even to discuss with them. You know, you you put your head down and pray because everybody else is putting their head down and praying, but you're thinking about groceries or why your kids can't sit still. And, you know, you're slapping them and telling them to be good. You know, you're just, there's so much here that's so distracting. But in that moment where I could feel him knowing me all the, all the way to my core, everything about me, every thought, everything, I, I pulled back. And I knew that he couldn't do that without my permission. Or maybe he could, but he wouldn't. And so I pulled back and I just wasn't sure, you know, I had some issues with God. And I wasn't sure that, that I felt safe letting him in like that. And so he's there with me and... Um, we're going to go through not really a life review, but just a couple of things. And, and I'm like, Oh, great. You know, and then I, I think of a couple good ones and I'm like, okay, maybe he'll bring that one up. That's a super good one. I'm proud of that. Um, <laughs> just cherry picking right, right. <laughs> like oh, that one. Um, <laughs> and so he says, um, he, this scene opens up and it's like, you're there, but you know, you're an observer. And um, the first thing was a good scene. And it was me in this grocery store in this little Save-A-Lot in the little town that we lived in. And there was a woman in line in front of me and she was 72 cents short. And she was trying to figure out what to put back. And as a single mom, I knew what that was like and how embarrassing it is. And it's just, it's embarrassing. I, I just remember being so ashamed that I had to put something back. And and I, I could see her going through it and I knew exactly what she was thinking. She's like, well, the kids like the macaroni and cheese. I don't really need this moisturizer, you know, and you always, you always short yourself because you're going to do the best for your kids. And, and so I fish around and I find the money and I hand it to her and she's like, oh, no, no. And this is where we are in the world. She was ashamed to take 72 cents. 
I mean, what is that off me? That's nothing. That's nothing off most people. She would rather just go without some basic thing that she needs because we have gotten so, we have it so ingrained in us, this idea of independence and to have to need or rely on anybody else's weakness. And it's shameful. And I, I remember feeling that in myself under those same circumstances and just being profoundly grieved that other people felt that way too. Because every time you open yourself up and expose your vulnerability and let someone else help you, that grows them spiritually. So this thing where we don't reach out to each other and we don't ask for help and we don't call when we're having trouble, you know, we don't want to bother anybody. We are spiritually draining the world by doing that because that is not how we're supposed to function. And so, you know, there I am with her and, and I'm like, wow, this seems like a small thing. I hadn't even remembered this till you showed me. And, and I remember like that word, those words echoing small thing, small thing, small thing. And then the whole scene opens up and it's her years down the road and she's working in a food pantry and she's handing out groceries. And this woman comes in with exactly the same feeling that she and I had both had at other times in our life, ashamed that she's having to go and get free food. And the lady was like, it's okay. It's okay. I've been there. It's all right. I'm going to help you out. Everything's going to be okay. And I'm like, 72 cents. That's huge. Who knew? You know, I mean, I would have picked a million other things that I had done that seemed bigger, but that was the thing. And he's like, you've got to realize your, your purpose is whatever I put in front of you that day, whatever person crosses your path. Everybody thinks it's this one big thing and, you know, what's your gift and that's the thing you're supposed to, it's not, it's a million things every day. It's that person that something's tugging at you to talk to that you don't talk to because you don't know them. Um, it's kind of getting over ourselves to be able to see that and see where God needs you to work because we all have that. You know, like I'll think um, there, there's some people that live across the street and one day I was looking out the window and it was awful outside and their flag had fallen and it was about to touch the ground. And, you know, my dad was a Navy SEAL. My son was a Marine. I was in the Army. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, their flag's going to touch the ground. And it, you know, without even thinking, I ran over there. The pole was broken, so I took it apart and unscrewed it and set it on the porch, brought the flag back. The end of it was like muddy where it had hit the porch, um, laundered it properly, folded it properly, put it in a box. And when Don got home, I'm like, hey, will you take this over to them? Um, you know, I didn't want it to hit the ground. And so you have all these little opportunities. You know, you see somebody's trash cans laying on its side. There's just you, it, and every day. And it, it, puts, it puts value out into the world spiritually. And if enough people do that, it starts changing the mindset. And it's proven to be true. Um, and so I just, I don't know. It just seemed like a small thing. And it wasn't the thing I was proudest of by any, but the ripple effect was huge. And so then I'm like, okay, well, now we're going to have to go through bad things. And boy, it seems like there's a lot of those to choose from. And, um, <laughs> and so he pulls up this um, scene of this, um, this woman that I used to work with that I could not stand. She just, she wasn't nice to the patients. She wasn't nice to the people she worked for. She was difficult. Um, you know, she'd have a patient on a bedpan. And if you've never sat on a bedpan, it is very uncomfortable. And if the call light went off for an hour because the tech couldn't get there, then that's how long the patient sat on it. And I just could never abide that. I'm like, no, the tech's busy. I can run in there in five minutes and do it. And, and so I just disliked her for that reason. And so God showed me her life. And he showed me all the horrible things her dad had done to her as a little girl. And I, had, and I just was stunned. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, she should be a monster considering what she endured as a little girl. And she grows up with nobody caring for her, the people that you're supposed to count on to love you, that you, that you don't have to invest in that. You know, you're a little kid. They just love you because you're their kid. It wasn't like that. He was, you know, her tool or his tool for pleasure. And, and I mean, how warped is that? And even with that going on, ever since she could remember, when she gets grown up enough to be able to decide what she's going to do with her life, she wants to help people. Now, is she great at it? No. Um, but in that moment, God was like, you need to learn to control your thoughts. So I've never been a person to gossip, and I hate gossip. I think it is the single most destructive thing that people do. 
And so I've never had a lot of female friends because females tend to gossip. And I just, people always thought I was weird. They would start talking trash about somebody and I would just turn around and walk away. I wouldn't even say anything. And I'm like, you know what? If you're talking about her, you're talking about me. And even if you're not, you have a mean spirit. And, and that's, I know she can't hear you and thank God, but I'm hurting for her now. And, and I just, I saw it so much in church and I just hated it, you know, and as a single mom, I got a lot of grief in church. Not, not that anybody would say, but you didn't get asked to certain things and you couldn't really volunteer for this thing or that thing because you, like church in Kentucky is way different than church in any other state I've ever lived in. Um, and it's good. There's good. How definitely. So? I've been to some great churches, but the bad ones, boy, they leave a mark on you. And, um, and so I just, I felt like, cause I had never said anything bad about that nurse that I hadn't really done anything wrong. And he said, you, you allowed yourself to entertain all these negative thoughts about her and to dislike her and to insult her in your own spirit, in your own mind. And that has energy. Yes, there's more energy if you speak it and there's more energy if you act on it, but it all starts with a thought. And when you, when you malign somebody like that with your mind and in your own spirit, it's not without effect on them. Their spirit senses it like that person looking at you from across the room and you look and you see who they are. She senses it. She senses that, that she's not good enough or she's just, you know, distasteful in your eyes or, you know, you don't think she's a good nurse. So rather than pour into her, and find something positive to say or something, you know, or let me help you with that and, and model good, good patient care for her. You just took it on yourself to mentally hate on her. And that makes it harder for her to get out of who she is and, and, and be more. And so you, you cripple her journey when you do that. And it, it floored me because I'd always been so careful to not talk bad about people. Um, but I had not been good about controlling my thoughts. And, and I mean, sometimes they're deserved. I know some really crappy people, um, but it doesn't help them get out of that. And, and it gets you kind of sucked into this negative thing where now you're working with this person and you're just, you know, you're grumbling the whole shift inside, you, you know, you're smiling and stuff, but inside you're super annoyed for a 12 hour shift and it takes a lot out of you. And, and I just thought it was interesting that that was the thing that he chose to show me, you know, about controlling my thoughts. And, um, as somebody who has to kind of work to be present and not always in my head, that's important. Um, did you have a question? Did you get into, if you don't sorry to cut you off, in regards to those thoughts, did, did you have to figure out on your own how to do that? Or is it simply just noticing them and then flipping? Yeah, them? it's like, a practice. What is your method now to, to control your so thoughts? So it's kind of like meditating. So I can get, um, and I, I see it in marriages a lot. People um, like... <laughs> Like I'll, I'll, oh, I have this friend, I have a girlfriend who I just love. And if we're going to, we do this like joking thing back and forth. Um, so I'll say uh, today on mansplaining with Don, <laughs> because Don always mansplains things to me, right? So one day I'm outside painting and, and I, I had finished and we had this tent set up for me to paint in. And I, so I'd finished, I was turning everything off. And then I looked and I thought I saw something on the painted service. And so I was, the, the outside light was on, but the lights inside the tent were. So I kind of got close to it and tried to brush it off to see what it was. And Don walks in and he's like, um, you know, you'd be able to see that better if you turned on the light. And I'm like, don't, don't say it. Just, just. He's just trying to be helpful. So I messaged Frida and I'm like, today on Mansplaining with Don, Don explains how light works. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he's not trying to be a jerk. He's trying to be helpful. He's a sweet, sweet guy. And so then like one day I'm in the kitchen and um, we had both been sick. And, and I told him, I said, gosh, I'm just praying for your recovery. Um, I'm, I, the day that you get your strength back and you can open the dishwasher and lift that bowl from the sink to the dishwasher, I'm going to celebrate your complete healing. You know, and I'm like, Penny, don't be a bitch, you know? <laughs> But I'm like, you're a big, strong guy. Can you? It's like 20 more inches. Can you? But those are the things that make you crazy. And what happens in marriage often is you get caught up in this focus of the things that that person does that make you nuts. And if you're not careful, um, you can grow hate for them. And it can destroy a marriage. And so Don and I have talked about this a lot. And after my near-death experience, I was a mess. I, I, you know, people are like, oh, that's great. You know, you were with God. And, and I'm like, okay, imagine 
imagine a baby in its mother's arms as loved as it's ever going to be and somebody just ripping that baby out of its mother's arms and then throwing it into this hostile environment. That's what it felt like. I'm like, everything here is harder. It's more painful. I was still super sick. Um, you know, it was just, it was, it was hard. And, and so I like started looking into all these different faiths and religions, you know, trying to find truth and, and, you know, what did I actually believe and, and what, what did I read that seemed right in my spirit? And, and Don came home one day and he said, you know what? Every day I'm worried that I'm going to come home and you're going to have shaved your head and, and you're going to have become a Buddhist monk. Well, now both of his parents are Methodist ministers. They've both since passed, but wonderful people. And, um, and I had read this book by um, Dr. Atwater and she was, it's something like 70% of people who have a near-death experience end up divorced. And I thought, wow, really? that's so tragic. And I looked at him and I said, I said, 70% of people who, who have a near-death experience end up being divorced. And I have to ask you, is God going to be the one thing that pulls us apart? And he thought about it for a long time, you know, and, and, and he's like, okay, no, we can work through this. And I realized, like, you know, don't have any negative feelings about Don because things were super weird for him. Like we'd be out some, we pulled into the driveway one day and we're talking about something and I could feel that looking at me sensation, right? And I look and it's the tree in the yard that had broken. It had gotten wind or lightning damage. I can't remember. And, and Don had cut it down to like a five foot stump, but hadn't gotten that stump down and, you know, just busy and whatever. And, and I, so I had been nagging him about it. I'm like, Don, come on. I mean, people drive by that just looks horrible. Please fix it. And, and he always had some excuse. He's a terrible procrastinator. And um, I looked at that tree and I turned around, this poor man, I turned around and I looked at him and I said, you can't cut the tree down. And he's like, what? I said, I can feel her loving me. Her name is Lola. And I'm like, what the hell, Lola? Is she a showgirl? Because it's an old Barry Manilow song, right? So I get in and I look up the name Lola and it means suffering. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I just could feel that tree telling me, watch, watch what I'm going to do. And that tree is whole today. That tree is a beautiful pear tree. You'd have never known. She, she's got the damage on one side, but just to walk by, you'd never know. And I thought, look what God grew out of what you thought was dead. You know, it, he didn't just fix it a little bit. There weren't just little weird things. It looks like nothing ever happened to it. And that's what love does, you know. And, and that's just God showing you love right there in your front yard. So here we're, you know, we're back now and we've kind of gone through the good and the bad. And um, I realized that I have this opportunity to go deeper with God and I'm scared. I don't want to do it. And then like all of the things that I had held against him for all of the years just bubbled up in my chest and I was angry. And I, he's, he was kind of expressing this love that he had for me. And, and I said, you know what? I, no, I'm calling BS. I don't believe that. And, and he didn't like flinch or anything. Like he didn't love me less. He didn't reject me for having doubts, which I just, that wasn't my understanding of God at all. And, and he was going to hear me out. And I said, look, you know, everybody says you're this loving God and, and, and you're for us. And, and if, you know, we just reach out and ask you and we believe you'll, you'll fix things, but you didn't, you know, when the kid's dad left, you know, it was one thing for him to leave me but to completely abandon his kids and never try to have a relationship with them, even though I tried to facilitate that, I'm like, you could have fixed that and you didn't. You hurt innocent children by not fixing it. And I don't forgive you for that. You know, I was just really hurt by it. And, and he was so compassionate. And, you know, I'm like, here this person throws this anger and vitriol at you and, and you respond you know, like a parent would to a two-year-old that's throwing a fit, you know, that's, that's their whole world. They want that cookie right now. And they don't understand that it's dinner time and it's not good for them. And you've got something that's going to nourish their body. They want what they want when they want it. And if you're not going to give it to them, they're going to raise holy hell, right? Well, you don't hate that child, you know, you scoop them up and you get their dinner and you love them. And it's just a hard day. That's what he did. You know, he, he was like, let me show you something. You've completely misunderstood me. And so he shows me this scene. I'm sitting in, on, a, um, on these bleachers with my son at the ball field where my daughter played soccer. And his little boy at the time when all of this happened was two. But in this scene, he's, he's five. And I'm watching him run up and down the, 
field and he's so alive and I can see, you know, his tan skin and um, the sun shining on his hair and just so vibrant, you know, and he's running up and down that field and David looks at me. I never can get through this. I should just stop telling this part. Um, David looks at me and he says, I'm going to be the dad to him that I deserved. And I was like, and I just looked at God and I'm like, oh, wow. You're breaking that cycle, you know? You're breaking the, the, the cycle of what went on with my ex-husband's parents and what went on before them and, you know, how my parents struggled. You're, you're fixing it in this generation before my eyes. And I hated you for it. And I'm like, okay, you know, if we had to, if we had to take the bullet for that, to, to stop it now so that my grandkids don't go through it and my great grandkids don't go through it. It was worth it. It was worth the suffering. I see beauty in this. And I, you know, it was just, it was just crazy to have, to see it. You know, it's like when you're, when you're on the road and you're stopped and you're, you're leaning over to the side, you're trying to see, can you get around this person? What's going on up there? And you're getting more and more irritated, you know, um, but the person who's up on the hills, like, oh my gosh, you know, I hope those people are okay. I hope they don't die. This is this looks like a terrible accident. And they're praying for them while you're back here pissing and moaning because you can't. And that's God. He's up at the top. He sees it. And he's like, oh gosh, I can totally understand where you thought that was a lack of love for you and your kids. Of course, that's what you would see down there. But let me show you. And I'm like, and then that verse just comes to me as I'm thinking it, you know, um, um, God turns all things to good for those who love him. And I'm like, even if you don't see it in this life, you know, you have to trust in that. So, and that situation actually happened when Cole was five. It happened in real life. And it was such a validation for me that, that all this had happened and I wasn't crazy. But so we're there and he shows me that. And, um, and I knew at that moment that we were going to go deep, but that I had to surrender to do it you know, and that's something that's really hard for a single mom who's been divorced to completely make yourself vulnerable. Um, I mean, even in my marriage, it's been something that I've really worked hard at because it's just, it's difficult. I tell people, you know, I was raped in college by a friend and all those little things add up and you, and you, you, um, it's kind of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If safety isn't met, that's all you focus on is safety. And, and everything else comes second. Oh, yeah. And so I just never felt safe. And Don was finally that person I could feel safe with. And, and it was, it was life changing for me. And, and so there I am with this God who I've held responsible for all this stuff in my life. And, and he wants me to come with him, but I have to let him all the way in to do it. And so I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to trust you. And as soon as I said it, the light from him started swirling and it pooled at my feet and it started coming up through my feet and through my legs and it was so warm and it got up into my middle and you know where you have all that like visceral strain and nervousness and you know where you just feel sick about things. Like everything that ever happens to you, it leaves this little visceral physical imprint on you. It's it's in there. They're, they're like these little emotional scars. And his light was like this cloak wrapped around inside me and it was healing all those things and it came up and it went around my heart and then it came up my neck and it went into my mouth and I started singing and I'm a horrible singer and it was beautiful I'm like oh man this is cool if I go back I want to keep this one um and it, it it just was incredible um and then it and then it came up and it was I could see like feel it behind my eyes and for some reason, I didn't want it to get out. And I thought I could contain the love of God, which is just so, it's kind of cute, you know. And so I squeezed my eyes shut because I didn't want it to get out. And it shot out my eyelids and out my eyelashes. And and then it bounced off God's light outside me and it rushed back in and it went into my brain. And I could feel it going through every curve in my brain. All the things, I knew all the things, all of them. I couldn't tell you what they are now. But everything, I understood everything. Everything made sense. And I was like, oh my God, like I knew that there were parts of my brain that I had never accessed before. And they were all working, they were all lighting up. And it was crazy because I could see things like flowers and, um, and each flower had its own color and its own vibration. And God had a vibration, a resonance. 
And, and it was the key of G. And I didn't know what it was until I got back. And we were at church and this lady was playing this song in the key of G. And it, it was so, it was such a strong reminder of what God sounded like that I had a hard time staying in my own body. I was like, okay, you know, you can't like pop out because you're at church and people think you're crazy and you already have social anxiety. So you don't want to add to that. And, um, <laughs> and I asked Don, I'm like, what is that? Is that like a certain key or what? Cause he's a musician. And he said, that's G. And I'm like, we have to go up there. So after church, we walked up there and I know she probably thought I was crazy. And, and I put my hands on the piano and I stood close enough to it that it was touching my abdomen and the tops of my legs. And I'm like, will you play that again? And I said, I died. And um, I was with God and he, he resonates in the key of G. Could you play it again? And she did. She, you know, she honored that. And, and I could just feel it all over again. Like he was back in me with all of that love and light. And I'm like, wow, that's just, and I hadn't even put together. That's what it was until then. So anyway, he's going through, he's up in my brain. I'm, I'm knowing all these things. And then he's going to take me on this trip. And we're going to go through the strands of my DNA. And I'm like, I didn't even know you could do that. And I'm like, wow, this is just crazy. And so, you know, it's this, this spiral sort of thing. And we're going through it. And I can see, you know, the chromosomes. I can see my genetic code. And, and I, as we're going through, I can feel the strands like going over my skin, like, you know, like you'd stroke somebody that you love. Um, and they're just brushing over me. And we're going through and we're going through. And then he stops. And it's like, and we were going super fast. <laughs> and and he just suddenly stops and it was jarring. And I was like, whoa, what? And he's like, do you see me? And I'm like, well, yeah, I'd see you. You're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, how would I not see you? And he's like, no. And he points at my DNA and he said, right there, do you see me? And I looked and it was God. I'm like, you're in my DNA? He said, I built you. I made you. He said, you, you can no sooner deny that I am your father than that your physical father is your father. You can, you can say it's not true your whole life, but we can get your DNA and prove it so. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I am in you. You just had to remember it. And that's it. That's all of us. He's in there. You just kind of have your slate wiped clean when you get here. And your whole journey is to figure that out, that he is in there. And how could you not love these people that you're in? You know, it's like, I never can understand how people can walk away from their children. I'm like, that's a little me. I made that person, you know, I, I mean, I've wiped their butts. I know everything about them. I adore them. And in that moment, God adored me. Like he was so, what is that word where you, you first meet somebody and you're just so captivated by them and like everything they do is just wonderful and adorable. And, um, it's not love. It's called a, it's like infatuation. And, infatuation. But his wasn't um, transient. He was completely infatuated with me. He thought I was funny. He knew I was smart. He, it's like, you know, you go to pick your best friend up at the airport and they run off the, or your, your girlfriend or whatever, and they run off that airplane into your arms. And in that moment, just there's so much meaning. And that was him. He's not the one running off the airplane. He's the one standing there. He's like, man, I adore you. I am so excited to be here with you. You're awesome. And I thought, he, this is all on purpose. He made me on purpose. God, in everything that he has, and in everything he had made before me, was a parent. You know, he was like, you know what, I'd love to have a little girl. And I'd give her dark eyes and dark hair and I'd make her silly and funny. And she'd have these weird fears of clowns and, you know, social phobias and stuff. And, um, and, and, and she would be a bright light to the world. And I wondered how long, I wondered how long he dreamed of me before he actually set to making me. And then I wonder, is, is he was knitting me together? You know, was, was he thinking about all the good I'd do and all the trouble I'd get into as a little kid and, and still he kept sewing, you know, he kept knitting me together because I was on purpose for a purpose, you know, and, and he knew what it was. And I was just like that the God of the universe would put that much care and attention into just me. You know, if it had been nobody else, it, it, he'd have done it for me. And I just, there's just no love like that, you know? So we get to that DNA and, 
and I see him there and I realize I have to make this decision about going back and that it's my decision to make. But it felt like something, like a decision I had made before or something, like a, like I had preordained it or something. And I had to decide whether to go back and I didn't want to go. And initially my knee-jerk reaction was no, no, of course I'm not going to go back. This is amazing. Yes, it's going to be hard on my husband and the kids, but they'll get here eventually. This is all over very quick. You have no idea how fast this goes, seconds. And, um, and I'm like, it all works out. They'll be okay. God will work it for good. And I just knew I was lying to myself. And I just, it just felt icky, you know, like, I don't know. It just felt bad. And I was like, Penny, he knit you together. He thought about you for a long time before he made you. And you got into that life and, and you let hurt take over and you built yourself a cell and you locked yourself away in it and you didn't really live, you know, and he designed you to live and he designed you to make a difference in the world. And yes, you can stay here now and he's not going to hold it against you. But can, do you feel proud of what you did? You know, even though it wasn't my fault, it was my reaction. And and I was like, no, I, I feel like I've let him down. I feel like I haven't done everything that I could have done and, and like I haven't lived. And so I decided to go back. Well, as soon as I made the decision, I could feel him pulling away. And it was just awful. It was like that baby being torn from its mother's arms. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. You know, and I'm already crying. And and he's like, what? And And I said, let me remember it. If you don't let me remember it, I won't have any hope. Please let me remember it. And I woke up and I remembered it. And that nurse was sitting right there. And she's like, well, there you are. You're back. And I'm like, I was with God. And she's like. Immediately you said that? First words out of my mouth. I'm like, she says, <laughs> what? I'm like, I was with, I mean, just now I was with God. And she's like, oh, that's nice, dear. And I'm like, in a religious hospital. She's like, let me go get your family. And I'm thinking, she thinks I'm crazy. I was really with God. So they come in, the family comes in and I'm like, I was with God. I mean, just like a few minutes ago with him. And they're like, oh, that's good. And they're looking at the nurse, like, is she going to be okay? Or, and she's like, well, let's not get her all excited. It's her first day off the ventilator, you know, so let's, let's do some more visiting tomorrow and let her get some rest. And I'm thinking, man, I've been in a coma for how long, how much more rest do I need? And so they all leave and she she turns the lights off in the room and she actually closes the curtains so that you can't see through the glass doors. And I'm laying there in the bed and God comes to, into the room, like the light comes into the room, scares the crap out of me. I scream. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he laughs. And he's like, what? And I'm like, well, I thought you were gone. He said, I'm never gone. I'm like, well, I know, but you don't just pop into rooms like that. That's startling, you know, and he thought it was hysterical. And um, he said, um, I want to give you this message and I want you to share it with the world. And so he gave me this message. I didn't have pen or paper or anything. I actually didn't get to write it down until the next day. Um, and I remember as he said it to me, and then the next day as I heard it back and I was writing it down, I thought, I'm not sharing this with anybody. This is the most beautiful love letter and every, anybody's ever written me. And I want to have this for myself because I had so few things for myself. My whole life was taking care of my kids, taking care of other people. You know, I, I always said once my kids were grown, I would have matching clothes. I would have matching bras and panties. I would have matching pajamas. I would not wear T-shirts from the Goodwill anymore because, you know, that at that point I was going to value myself, which is crazy. Um, and I just, I just wanted to have, it was like this physical proof of that intimate connection. And so I want to say... Thinking, I don't think I shared that until summer of 2020, um, after I got over COVID, and I don't, and I'd almost died from COVID. Um, I the um, Dallas Fort Worth Friends of IN's group had asked me to do a Zoom meeting and speak to their group, and I did. And and before I did it, God was like, "I asked you to share that, and for you to continue keeping it to yourself is theft." And I'm like. All right, fine. You know, I'm not a thief, and and so I pulled it up so I could read it to your folks, because it is. Um, well, I thought I pulled it up. Um, how, how long were you in a coma for? I think the first time it all kinds of runs together because there were eighteen and two and a half years. Um, I think the first time, like four or five days. I remember I was in the when I woke up, my dad's birthday had already passed. So I can't remember wow. if that was the first time or the second time because I had like a, 
after the first time, like a week and a half or two weeks later, it happened again. Um, and those two run together. I can't remember. But most of the times were like four or five days. If they tried to take me off the ventilator before four or five days, I just would kind of crash and burn and have to be back on. And so... How long did it feel like you were in this place? Um, on the other side? Yeah. Um, I, the you dark... Can you fathom, the, even calculate it? Say that again? Can you even fathom how long it was? Or just, the dark place, like the forever. void, if I had to put it in... I don't know why I can't get out of this. Um, if I had to put it in... There it is. In time that would make sense to you, I would say 10 years in the void. And then... It felt like 10 yeah. years. Good. But time's Lord. different there. I mean, it's it's like the, our perception of time. We measure time there the same way we measure it here, how it feels. Um, and there it's just, it's different. But I mean, something that seemed to take a long time could go by and I would say it was like two seconds. It's just really weird. It's not at all. Uh, it's kind of like, the, you ever see the movie Interstellar? Uh, is that the one where they're in space and... With Matthew McConaughey? No, I don't think I, I saw the one with Sandy well, Anyway, there's like a, there's, they were traveling through space, and <clears throat> even though like ten years passed on Earth, it was a lot faster for them from where they were. So I kind of was co- kind of correlating it to that, even though it was ten, you may say it was ten years, maybe it didn't feel like ten years. Yeah, there was a there was a movie. Um, I thought it was Interstellar, where they're like, uh, one of them gets lost, like away from the ship, and they have to leave them. And I can't remember what movie that was, but I went and saw it with my sister in law, and there's this sound. So when they're, when they're out of the spaceship, there's this sound. And I, I can't tell you what it is. You'd have to watch the movie. I'll have to ask Don what it was. But um, there's nothing, but there's a sound to it. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, that sounds like the void. I wonder if space really oh, sounds like that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for going off topic. I feel like you're about to give everyone the meaning of life, and I'm, uh, <laughs> no, I'm delaying it way too much. Close. Um, so... <laughs> You're adorable, though. I know, I'm just teasing. <laughs> okay, so this was the message he'd given to me, and then I've got one more thing to share with you. Um, so when I had my near-death experience, God gave me this message to share with the world. God said, Such folly to think anything escapes my knowing, as when you were with me, all at once, all that I allowed you to know, you knew. No words were spoken, nor were they shouted. I whispered them to your spirit. I discreetly filled you with knowing. Knowing flowed into you as effortlessly as taking a breath. Is it not so? The great I am. No truer words have ever been spoken or written. The great I am is in your core. The great I am is the light. Even when I am hidden, still I am. As my energy charge sending me over each synapse in your brain, even those small fibers knew that I am. They rose and fell to the rhythm I created, to the symphony I composed, I conducted. I consider it a tragic comedy of arrogance when man denies what the smallest innervation knows. Man thinks he acts and moves outside my knowledge. How could it be so? I say, I proclaim, he does not. His own fibers clutch themselves, laughing at the idea. I am the flower, the wind, the rain, the sinew, the marrow, the rock, the author, the maker, the touch that set in motion all that you see and all that you know and all that you do not see or know. I knit you. I put breath in you. I am coded in every cell. Every nanosecond of time falls in step as I will it so. I am in you. I am in you. I am all. Even when you perceive nothing, still I am there. As I tell you this here and now, pressing my truth into your breast, your very heart presses it in further. And I just thought that was such a beautiful... (sighs) It's just crazy. that's that's the message that came to you all that that entire. That was how what did you remember that gave me in the hospital room. Yeah, and it's funny because I remembered it the next day to write it down, even with fentanyl and whatever else was in my system. Um, but I mean, now to this day, I still have to read it. But I remembered it perfectly that next day and wrote it down because I remember reading it to See, the that, nurse. As remarkable as those words are, that it's kind yeah. of like that says something. The fact yeah. that you were able to write that down verbatim, like what what is that just appear to you. You know what I mean? That, I, that in itself is a miracle. It was like I was there again with him when I started thinking about it. Cause I remember thinking I That's didn't wild. have paper and I was really tired and I fell asleep before I realized it. And then when I woke up, it was the next day and I was like, Oh my gosh, I, I was, how am I going to share that? I'm not, I can't remember what he said. And so I asked for pencil and paper 
And I just closed my eyes. And I, re- I wrote the whole thing with my eyes closed. It was all over the page. Um, and it, it was exactly what he had said. And I'm like, how is that? And it's funny. So I've been writing a book forever since then. Um, a COVID hit and kind of totally threw me off track because I've been teaching on that ever since. But um, I, so I started, it's, it's so funny because when I'm writing, I'll look up and my hands will be so sore and ice cold and there'll be like 11 pages there that I don't remember writing. And I'm like, that's God. That's just the spirit of God moving through you and just kind of taking over the keyboard. And I always read it and I'm impressed. I'm like, wow, that's really good. You should write, you know, because <laughs> that's some handy information. Just pours out. Yeah, do what? So then where, so what does this do? I mean, so many questions, so much to, uh, to unravel, but in regards to what does that experience do with your head moving forward about life in regards to specifically what's next? Like, does that give you comfort? Does that give you assurance as to, you know, what's, what you think is going to happen next? Are you Well, I'm not peace scared of dying. With- so that's huge. That's um, for sure. The, the, the idea of death is so scary to people and it's so nice to be relieved of that, to not have any concern for my safety or well-being, especially through this whole COVID thing, because I did a lot of deep research early on that, you know, was really making my husband nervous. He's like, I don't think you should be talking about this. And I'm like, well, I can't. And it was funny because I remember posting something just just kind of generic in, in my Twitter thing. And um, I think Dr. Fauci had said something like um, he'd looked at the gain of function research and he knew it was dangerous and that it could leak, but he felt like it was worth it. And I'm like, okay, well, I wish we'd have had a say in that. Um, so I made this meme, and I'm not a good meme maker. I mean, apparently I am. Um, so you know, if you've seen Shrek, right? Of course. So that where Lord Farquaad's up on the balcony, and he's like, some of you, some of you will die, but that's a chance I'm willing to take, or that's a sacrifice I'm willing <laughs> yeah. to make. Well, I just took and I put Fauci's face on his. And I'm like, okay, so this one lady freaks out. She messages me, and she's like, you know, I didn't believe in God until I heard your story. And then I see this awful political thing you've done. And, and I just, you know, I just can't even believe what you've said. And I don't believe in God. And I'm like, whoa, hold oh, up there, God. girl. You know, <laughs> take a breath. I said, um, first of all, if your faith is that shaky, you've got more problems than me. And second of all, he actually <laughs> said that. I just kind of reworded it a little bit. Like I didn't, because I'm not super political. I'll speak on public right. health policy because I'm a nurse and I can't stop myself. But as far as politics, I think they're all pretty rotten, you know, and I, I just don't like any of them for the most part. But she was really upset about that. And so I told her, I said, it's interesting to me that you would think my having a near-death experience would somehow make me less opinionated about the truth. Time yeah, short. the opposite shit. Right? Yeah. I'm like, I can't not say it because it's true. I, I have to say it. You know, people are being heard. I have to say something. Otherwise, I'm complicit. And, and then I just typed in hashtag not your guru. And I'm like, <laughs> if you're looking yeah, at me, <laughs> do what? Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the wild thing about what you went through. It's uh, I can see how, I mean, I can't see because obviously I, have no, I, can't exp- I haven't had that experience. But how being in a place like that, regardless of what it was and coming back to reality, whatever mm-hmm. the hell reality is, can be so confusing because ha- after having an experience like that, I'm, I'm sitting as like, I probably have so many more questions about yeah. what, what are we experiencing now? Because I feel like you've kind of seen maybe the finish line, of the, maybe not, of course, maybe that's a poor way of saying it. Yeah. You've seen potentially what's next, and now you still have to live this life that I feel like to me that, that, would, that would open Pandora's box of what the hell are we doing here? It's crazy. You know, I, I remember telling Don um, and being very tearful about it. And it's funny because I was never a crier because I bought, you know, I had a wall. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, but now I'm like so easily brought to tears and, and I just feel things because I let myself and, and this whole thing happened with COVID and I got really sick. Like I was one of the first ones to get sick. I got sick March 12th, 2020, couldn't get a test, um, got meds initially. And then the protocol we had went to a lower dose. And within three days of the lower dose, I had relapsed. Well, I don't know what I was thinking, but when I got sick, most of the country had not seen COVID yet. And I'm like, okay, I'm a nurse with COVID. This is great insight for people who are going to be seeing this. It's coming their direction. Um, and so I did almost every day of my illness, I did a live video, no matter what I looked like. And it got scary. I mean, I, I really did almost die. 
And I knew, I knew I wasn't going to go to the hospital. I had already signed a do not intubate order the last time I was intubated. And, and so I actually reviewed it with my doctor and with Don and said, I'm not going back to the hospital. They've said I will not survive the ventilator. There's no point in me going because that's all they're offering. And I don't want to die on a ventilator. I'd rather die at home. And so Don was like just freaking out and everybody watching is like, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And like 86% of them are dying. No, I'm not going. And um, so I got, I got hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, did the first day at the high dose, then went down to the lower dose within three days relapsed and was sicker than I was before. And in that amount of time, the governor had pressured the board of pharmacy to write up some kind of rule that was very vague. Um, that none of the pharmacists understood. So when the doctor called in the higher dose, nobody would fill it. And I'm like, I was already on this just a few days ago, you know, and I was getting better and now I'm getting much worse. I really need this medicine. And they're like, well, you have to, you have to have a positive COVID test to get it, which is not what the policy said. And I'm like, I can't get a COVID test. I, I tried three times. They would not, I couldn't qualify for one. I hadn't been to China. That was basically the requirement or exposed to a known case. I'd called the hotline and which is poison control here and they're like poison control and I'm like oh crap sorry you know and they're like no 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 do you have COVID I'm like I think so and um and she's like oh well have you been out of the country and I said well no I just told you everywhere I was and she's like um have you been exposed to a known case I said well I don't know who are the known cases she's like well I don't know I said well if you don't know how would I I'm assuming I mean it's not just falling out of the clouds right I, <laughs> I have 104.9 temperatures something's wrong and But I could not get a test. And then by the time I could get one, I was on oxygen and I couldn't go. They don't give you portable oxygen because um, you're not supposed to leave your house. And so I just got sicker and sicker and sicker. And, it, you know, by the, by the time we finally got the meds, um, I had viral sepsis. My kidneys were failing. My liver was failing. And we knew this because I had bought medical grade urine test strips because no lab would let me come in and no one would let me come in for a chest X-ray. Nobody. I'm like, how can you totally deny? I'm a nurse. I've worked through four pandemics. We don't deny patients care. And they're like, you can never come in. And I'm like, what do you mean never? Like if I survive this? And she's like, no. I'm like, you're insane. Um, but I couldn't go get any testing. So I got the test strips and had like the highest bilirubin you could have in your urine, which is a sign of your liver failing. Huge protein as high as it would go, which is kidney failure. Um, and my Facebook tribe, because I was the COVID-19 warrior, um, my Facebook tribe lost their minds. We had thousands of people from all over the world watching. And they went after the Board of Pharmacy and after the governor. And the governor never responded. Um, but the Board of Pharmacy on the sixth day of that fight, which was several weeks into my illness, um, I got on and I told people, I'm like, okay, guys, here's the thing. We're not going to get the medicine. And that's tragic. And I don't want to die. But sometimes it takes tragedy to bring light to a situation. So if I die, I need you to tell my story because I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Nobody should be denied medicines that their doctor thinks can help them. I don't care what academic uh, doctors say. This is crazy. We've always treated symptoms. This, this is nuts. And, and um, I said, you know, I don't want to die. I want to see my grandkids grow up and have babies. Um, and so there was this story in the Bible that I always hated, and it was the story of Job. And so Job um, loves the Lord. I think that's like how it opens. Job loves the Lord and is dedicated to God. And um, Satan tells God, he's like, hey, you know, the only reason he loves you is because you're so good to him. If calamity fell on him, it, it, you know, he wouldn't love you. And so God is like, oh, um, that's not true. But I tell you what, do your worst. You can do anything you want to him. Just don't kill him. And I remember reading that and thinking, what kind of warped deity are you? Are you like, you, you can point to one person who totally loves you. And that's the guy you screw with. There's like all these other people that are half hearted. Like, why wouldn't you go poor Job, you know? And, and I hated the story because to me, it just seemed arrogant. And it was this whole, you know, we're all going to get to heaven and we're just going to sing to God all day long. I'm like, how big is this person's ego? This is insane. How could you, like, if somebody followed me around my house singing for 45 minutes, I would be like, please stop can you imagine eternity? And I'm like, I just had these really messed up ideas, right? And so I'm doing that video. And like I said, I'm not one to cry. And I got really weepy. And I'm like, you know, you guys have loved me through this. I could not have gotten through this without all of your support. They were amazing. Um, and I'm teaching like the whole time, <laughs> like everything, I, every research thing I read while I was sick, I would teach them that day. 
And, um, and I start, I thought about Job and I'm like, oh my gosh, you idiot. Job knew that he was not his body. He knew he was a spirit inhabiting a body and that if he died or if it got, you know, worse and he suffered and died, it wasn't going to matter because he wasn't his body and he was going to be with God. And if, and God must have some greater purpose to serve that Job couldn't understand from where he was in the traffic jam because he couldn't see it from up here, but he was willing to trust to that extent. And it meant something to me that day. And I was like, okay, guys, it's just the way it is. And I just want you to know how much I love you and how much I appreciate your support. You guys have been incredible. And I got off there and I actually fell asleep and I had not been sleeping because I'd been in so much pain, just excruciating bone pain. And at four, I don't know, like 449 Don calls, he's like, get online. The whole world is looking for you. So I get on and my friend Deirdre is like, I got hold of Larry at the State Board of Pharmacy. This is his number. Call him before he leaves. And we had the meds by seven o'clock that night. So it took me 53 days to recover, to come off oxygen, to stop having 102 temps every day. And I've been teaching ever since on that. But I just, it's so funny because here I'd had all of this trouble on the ventilator. We figured out I had a mast cell activation disorder, which went into remission and we should hit that real quick. So the last time, the 18th time that I went into respiratory failure, um, I was back with God again. And I told him, I'm like, I'm done. I, I don't know like what you're, and, and part of it was, is we never knew when it was going to happen. I could wake up in the middle of the night and be an anaphylaxis. We could be eating. They're like, you've got to be like intentionally taking something you're allergic to. And I'm like, why? Because ventilator drugs are so good? No, what the, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but you know, when they can't figure it out, they start uh, grasping at straws, I guess. But um, I, you know, I was back with God and I was just done. I'm like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I can't go through it because it's terrifying. I remember sitting in that emergency room and them pulling out the code cart and they're like, we're going to have to intubate you. It's going to be okay. And I can just remember looking at Don across the room and just crying because I didn't want to go on the ventilator again. And one of the times that we went on, the, the drug that they gave me that's supposed to put you to sleep didn't work. So I was paralyzed, but I couldn't speak and I couldn't open my eyes. So I felt them intubate me. I felt them put the catheter in and I couldn't signal to anybody that I was awake. And so when we finally got to ICU, my dad's like, why is her heart rate 196? And the lady's like, oh, she's crying. I think she's awake. And that's when, you know, so I'm like, people don't want that. How do they not notice that? I don't get it. <laughs> right. thank, thank God for my dad. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, I'm like, this isn't something that people are choosing for attention or there's probably a lot of diseases you could do that with. This is not one of them. So we figured out I had this finally, figured out I had this mast cell disease and that what they had told us was that people who get it generally in two years or so, it just stops um, and they never have any more problems or they die. Those were the two things and there was nothing to treat it. And um you know, we were already past the two-year mark, so we figured I was just going to die. And uh, I forgot what I was why I was telling you that. Oh, so I was back with God, and I told him, I'm like, I'm done. Just take me or heal me. I, I just, I can't do it anymore. I can't watch my family go through it. It's so scary. And and he's like, it's not me, it's you. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's, you're God. You could so fix this. And he's like, it's not <laughs> it's not for me to fix. You said you were going to go back. You said you were going to live, but you're not. You're hiding still. You're not. I'm putting opportunities in front of you, people I need you to help, um, people I need you to share your story with, and you just keep saying no. If you want to live, then you've got to say yes. And I remember thinking that is the most asinine thing I have ever heard. I'm like, so you're telling me that if I go back and I say yes, I'll be healed. And he's like, yes. I'm like, okay, fine. You're God. Like, could you be any so less just believed it. trusting than I am, right? I'm like, fine, fine. I'll go back and I'll say yes. So I wake up. My friend Brian is the first person who calls me, asks me to come to Cincinnati and do a talk. I say yes. I'm like, oh my God, hang up because I'm going to tell a lie to get out of it soon because I do not talk in front of people. <laughs> and and I did it. I went and I've said yes ever since. And we've not been in the hospital again. So, I mean, how do you explain that? God. That's kind of my catch-all for anything That's I can explain. <laughs> I mean, oh I, I do see, so, you know, then I get COVID and I'm like, what the heck? I'd like, do you just delight in my torment? Um, but it was such a good thing. 
Because when I got COVID, I remember in that first week saying, this is like malaria and mast cell activation disorder had a love child. And because I had that insight, I developed my own protocol. And so all these doctors were like, you know, you're not going to be able to get this or that because there was all the political crap going on. And I'm like, okay, there's more than one way to skin a cat here. There are there are other things that have the same action as that drug that you can't get. So I just developed a complete over-the-counter protocol and started teaching it. And I'm like, this is a mast cell thing. Mast cells are at the beginning of all major inflammation, all, all allergy sort of reactions. And this feels very much like a prolonged uh, nosedive into anaphylaxis because just slowly and slowly, you just can't breathe no matter what you do. And, um, and so I'm like, you're going to need... Uh, antihistamines, you're going to need pepsid, you're going to need quercetin. And so I did this protocol, right? And was was teaching on all of this. And once I got well, I kept teaching and um, did a pre-jab protocol for people who wanted to get jabbed to help protect them from any fallout um, that they take for like two days before and then 30 days after and we start weaning them off it. And we're just experimenting with that one. And I'm like, look, it's nothing that's going to hurt people. It's worth a shot if we can prevent... My mom got myocarditis within 48 hours of her second vaccine. My brother had a vaccine injury, my daughter-in-law. Um, so I'm like, there's a reason that this is in front of me. And I ended up in this think tank with like doctors McCullough and Malone and um, all of them. And, and I was like, oh, I just want to listen, you know, because these guys are so smart. And, um, and I had ideas they didn't have yet that are now included in their protocols. And, and, no, no uh, way. Some yeah. big names right there. Yeah, I came up with like a beta dye. I did all this research into SARS-CoV-1 and viruses. And um, I'm like, beta dye neutralizes it in 30 seconds, even diluted to 0.5%. And so I did a re- video on how to make it. And everybody, and it lasts for three hours. It off-gasses for three hours. Works great. So I did all these this protocol because I understood when I got sick what was going on because I had felt all those things with mast cell. And I'm like, that's just that's just no accident. So what's interesting is, so your mom sent you a video um, and the guy that did the video, so the original video was with Brian on grief to growth. And if any of your listeners have lost a child, Brian runs a support group called grief to growth and it's just wonderful. Um, I had done an interview on Zoom with him. This guy that runs the Shaman Oaks channel on YouTube had reached out to Brian about doing an interview with me. And Brian had told me he might be contacting me. Well, I never heard from him. So I'm on vacation and we're out in the woods. So we have really crappy signal. And this friend of mine's like, hey, I saw your video the other day. It was really good. I'm like, I haven't done one recently. What are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, on the Shaman Oaks channel. So I go there and there was this one thing that I'd said in the video, which was I'm calling BS. And he used that as the title, which is that's to get clicks. Um, and, right. and I didn't know who he was. And I'm like, this guy has taken my story. This is a copyright infringement. So I'm like messaging him and he finally messages me. And, and I'm like, who gave you permission to use that video? And he's like, well, Brian said it was okay. And Brian's like, well, I assumed he had called you. And I didn't realize he hadn't. And, and I couldn't see. He was sending me screenshots of the conversations between he and Brian. Well, because I was in the woods, they weren't coming through. So I'm giving this guy down the road, like just, I'm like, you're lying. I know you're lying. And then I get home and I see all the screenshots and I feel like a total heel. And before, in my life, before my near-death experience, I just would never have spoken to him again because I was embarrassed about my behavior. Now it's very important to me to heal all relationships. And so I messaged him and I'm like, hey, I need to talk to you. And so I told him, I said, I want to apologize. I did not see those screenshots you know, and he could understand from what I was able to get at the lake that it n- none of what he was saying made sense. And and he had already taken the video down. I'd asked him to take it down. I was upset about the title. And he said, um, so he took it down. So I thought about it for a couple of weeks and I messaged him back and I said, you know, I'd like to do an interview with you. Um, your heart was in the right place. And, and I just feel really bad about my misunderstanding in this. And, you know, that I was so angry with you. And And so we were going to do it. And finally, he just put the video back up. He's like, I'm just going to put the video back up. I'll approve the title through you first. And he did. And then it, it, you know, like in two months, it had a million views. So that that video almost didn't happen that your mom saw that she shared with you that only because I wanted to heal that relationship ended up going back up. Then I get an, I get a Twitter tweet thing from uh, this gal and she's like, contact Red Pill 78. So he does a podcast and 
And I'm like, oh, he must want to talk to me about the COVID thing. And um, so I message him and he's like, yeah, I'll call you. So he calls me and he starts talking and I'm like, what is he talking about? I don't understand what he's referring to. And he said, well, I saw your video. And I'm like, well, was it one of my interviews on COVID? He's like, COVID? No. And I had sent him emails wanting to talk to him about COVID, but he hadn't seen him. And so he's like, no, the Shaman Oaks thing. I'm like, you want me to come on and talk about my near death experience? Like, you do this like conspiracy, this isn't a conspiracy sort of channel. And he's like, yeah, yeah, my girlfriend showed me the video. It was great. I want you to come on. So I end up going on and we end up talking about the COVID thing. And I give him the protocol so that everybody can get it and not die because that's my main goal. And, and it was just so funny because, <laughs> but for healing that relationship, he would not have seen it either. And so I just see God's hand in all of it. And I'm like, what a good God you are. You like to, to a degree that it's humorous, you know, like he knows me well enough. He's like, I'm going to do this in a way that'll even be funny. She'll love that. And the ripple effect, the right? Ripple it's, effect. it's interesting with the ripple effect, how much that, you know, obviously there's power in that. And I think that's how the world works. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I could totally see how, I think you kind of had yourself the same question, but you gave me that story about your, your son and yeah. kind of, um, stopping the fan, the generational idea of, you know, what you're of, of the father leaving. Yeah. But my point is I can see the challenge of people having, you know, animosity towards God or a creator or whoever you want to label it in regards to, okay, if he's this almighty power, yeah. why, why does he do it? I know, I know you're, why doesn't he just fix things? I know you're kind of, you're, I love your analogy with the traffic jam and yeah. you're not seeing the bigger picture, but it, it, I could totally see how it is a challenge when the people are in this moment, even with the horrible things that happen in this world, like the horrible, horrible, inexplicable things, it is very easy to be like, okay, but why would, like, what is the bigger picture with war? Like, what is the bigger yeah. picture with mass murders? What is the bigger picture with all that stuff? It's like, how the hell do you wrap your head around that? I get those questions a and, lot, uh, though. Like, I had a lady message me and her, uh, her son-in-law, who she loved, like her own child, um, fell off the roof and died in her arms. And just the amount of emotional suffering this woman was going through. And so she had messaged me and we talked and we talked and, and she, she was very upset with God, understandably. And she said, um, the Bible says that if you pray and believe that God will answer your prayers and, you know, and she's like, and I prayed and, you know, he's still gone. And so I told her, I said, what did you pray? She said, well, I prayed that God would send angels to surround him and keep him safe. And I'm like, are angels surrounding him, keeping him safe? And she's like, uh, yeah, I guess they are. And I said, you know, here's the thing. We see something and we define it by our own human perspective. And life is hard. And there are just things that are absolutely unfair. Um, but I told her, I said, here's the thing. You, you had such love for your son. And she's like, thank you for calling him my son. You know, even though he was her son-in-law, I knew she loved him like that. And I said, you have so much love for him. And I said, what do you do to carry on the amazingness that he was by just completely shutting yourself off and living in grief forever? Is that, you know, would he want you to live like that? Are you carrying on the love that he showed you by getting up on that roof and working on that roof because your husband had recently died and there was no one else to do it? He was taking care of you in, you know, in your husband's stead. And now it's on you to carry that forward. And yes, it's difficult and it's unfair, but I promise you it all works out. And so I have this theory, and I don't know this to be fact, um, that we have some say in what life we come to. Because to me, otherwise there is no, none of this makes sense. It is just mean. Um, but if we choose, like, so my theory is that, you know, we had this little boy that had cerebral palsy that used to go to our church, just yelled all the time, um, had no real discernible meaningful function. And, and my husband said one day, not to be mean, just, you know, doesn't really understand people with disabilities. And he's like, I don't understand why they don't put him in the nursery so that he doesn't disturb church. And I looked at him and I said, what if he is one of the most sacrificial souls? What if he had an opportunity to choose any life he wanted to, to come here and, and, you know, have this experience, but he decided to come and be completely helpless so that he could teach other people how to love. I mean, can you imagine that, being trapped in a body and not being able to do all the things you see everybody else doing? But the depth of love that these parents had for him and that everybody that knew that kid had for him. And I'm like, that's sacrifice. I'm not that big of a person. I couldn't do it. 
And so to me, if that's the case, then this makes more sense. I'm like, okay, then the child who dies from cancer, there was a greater purpose in that. And he came knowing. And, and it's not just, you know, random throwing darts, you know, your life's going to suck, your life's going to be tragic, you're going to have a really easy go. It's it's different for every person. And I'm like, that to me makes more sense with the character of the God that I met. You know, and it's like this whole burning in hell for everything. You know, I have a lot of people um, I have a lot of gay men reach out to me, a lot. And it breaks my heart because they're like, God can't love me because I'm so disgusting. And it just breaks my heart. I'm like, who told you that? Who told you you're disgusting? I am apologizing to you for that person that made you feel that way or said that to you. That is horrible. God does not feel that way about you. God adores you. I mean, like tickled pink, excited when you walk in the room, kind of loves you. Can't wait to get his arms around you, kind of loves you. And so I had got to have some really, and I always answer those. And this one guy had reached out to me and, and he was just telling me what, how he had just disappointed God his whole life. And it just, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're not, you're missing it. And I told him, I said, you know what? So he had ch shared his childhood with me and how his dad had like just willfully not loved him. Like he would go up to his dad with his arms out for his dad, you know, to hug him and, and the father would just turn around. And I'm like, whoa, that's like a special measure of cold. That's, that's not I'm busy or that's I see you need love and I'm going to not give it to you. And, and, and his mother didn't stand up for him. And so he'd had relationships with men and women, but identified as gay. And I said, I said, did it ever occur to you that you're not disgusting and evil? And maybe you're just using the tools at your disposal to try to fix that little boy that was injured by his parents. Of course you need love from a man. We all do, you know? I mean, even when you get married, my husband still shows me paternal love. I still show him maternal love because you don't ever stop needing that. And I'm like, you can give that to you. You don't have to go through the rest of your life not having that. You can find older men that will mentor you and that will love you like that and will pour into your life. And you can find women, um, especially older women, you know, that they, they want to pour into you. They want to affirm you and lift you up. And you never had that. Stop denying that to yourself. You're grown. You can go out and find it now. And I'm like, don't worry about the yeah, gay I thing. I think that kind of all goes back to what you said in the, uh, you know, one major lesson of your story in regards to the power of thoughts. And I think the power of thoughts of how you perceive other people, of course, but even how you talk to yourself, yeah. the thoughts of that you're ingraining in your subconscious and the thoughts, that you, the conversation you're having with yourself I feel like is a part of those conversations a man like that might be happy. He's constantly yeah. reaffirming himself that God doesn't love me. God doesn't oh. love me. People, I'm disgusting. I'm disgusting. And I mean, it starts on so many levels, but I think one of the big steps is the conversation and thoughts that you have with yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you grow up from the time you're little believing that you're unlovable. Something's wrong with you. And, and you know, and you have to fix that. You can't, you know, people seem to think, oh, you know, you get grown and you're just going to pretend none of that happened. And, and I'm like, it doesn't work like that. You know, I mean, I love my mom. She is not the most maternal nurturing person. When Don called her to, and I only say this because I'm sure she'll never hear this broadcast, but, um, and we're not on the outs or anything, but when Don called her and told her that I was being life flighted, she's like, well, you know, keep us posted. She lived like five minutes from the hospital. She wasn't being mean or anything. It's just it didn't occur to her that she should go. And as a child, I still need that, you know, and, and so God has been good to bless me with older female friends who have poured into me like that. Um, because, you know, I did deserve that. I did deserve to be loved and cherished and, you know, to have a cheerleader. And so I've got people in my life that do that now. And I really would encourage people to not assume that that's the end of your story, you know, that that was your childhood and that's the end of that story. And you close that book, find those people to help heal that because you deserve it. You deserve to be a loved child. I love that, Penny. I think that's the uh, the perfect way to put the cherry on top. What an amazing story. And there's obviously no surprise you've gotten so many views on this story <laughs> because there's so much there. There's a um, lot. I always pray. I'm like, God, there, there, tell me what this audience needs to hear. Because I'm like, I'm not going to keep telling the same story over and over again. Because, I mean, you can see that. Like, I don't understand the value in it. Um but I start, I, I will never, I don't ever do an interview unless I've got 14 days before it. And every day I pray, I'm like, God, tell me what this audience needs to hear, what there's somebody here that needs something specific. And I want you to guide me on what to focus on so that that person comes away with what they need. 
because otherwise me just telling my story and over, over and over is just noise, you know. It's got to change people for it to be meaningful for me. Yeah, well, clearly it's impacted people already. So I, I appreciate you putting that energy towards this podcast and this conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely going to text my mom right after this and let me know that we just spoke to yeah. you because she's going to be excited about that. Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> What's your mom's but, name? Uh, Rosanna. Rosanna, that's lovely. I love that. Yay, Rosanna. Yeah, I just a, feel like she's part of this bigger yeah, circle to help people. Yeah, my mom's a, my mom's a bull. She's, uh, you know, the, the biggest reason why I'm even here today besides maternally. Yeah, those single um, moms that have to, you know, kind of get through. Um, especially tragedy, you know, losing your dad and that, that can't have been easy. Yeah, she, she did it with flying colors. Isn't that crazy? It's, it's incredible. funny Seriously, how you it's, step it's, up. It's a whole other podcast talking about that woman. Yeah. Well, I'm hopefully someday. Uh, Penny, I'll thank you. So, thank you so much. I don't know if you want to uh, plug in and I mean, I'll put, oh. I'll put whatever you want at the bottom of the subscription to if people want to, you know, find out more about you and links and whatnot, but is there anything that you want to say before we get out of here? Yeah. So I've got the webpage. It's called, um, withhealthcoaching.com and it's W I T T. Um, and on there, there's, um, there's like the protocol, the over the counter protocol for the COVID stuff and the jabs and all of that. And if I'm getting ready to put some stuff up for some long haulers and, uh, um, then there's, we've just added a new section. So we're getting ready to put content into it, but there's a new section. So it's body and then it's mind and spirit. And we'll be adding stuff there. I'll be starting my YouTube and rumble channel soon. And it's, um, those, um, will be, uh, life from a near death perspective. You know, and how can we how can we look at life and make decisions from that perspective so that we're um, always making decisions with the goal in mind and not just randomly stumbling through life? <laughs> but yeah, that's the website. My that's email's actually something on there. I'm working on. Hmm? Sorry, the the, the stump, stumbling through life, having a goal creates that order that is so important. You know, and I've never really. I mean, it took me some time to realize the importance of setting a goal. As cliche as that sounds, there is a reason for that. There really <laughs> so. is. It gives you direction every day, you know, and you don't wander through just feeling like you have no purpose because you can see yourself right. getting closer and closer. Yeah, and by the way, purpose, I, I know we're wrapping this up, but what's really stuck to me is that idea of, uh, you know, I feel like we're running through life always looking for a purpose. And that hit me at home too because I've always put so much focus on what's my purpose? Why am I here? What should I be doing? What one thing should I be doing uh. with that? To kind of go back to what you said about the, you know, there's there's always something presented in front of you that day that could be your purpose for that moment yeah. or for that day, as little as if it was 73 cents or 72 cents, whatever it was, yep. as little as that, it's like, that is your purpose. That day-to-day -day mm -hmm. stuff can be your purpose. It doesn't always well, have to what's be, fun about be that? Leonardo DiCaprio starring in a, in a movie or right, whatever the right. hell, you know, your, your real life drive is. That's one thing, but, you know, the little things really matter too. Well, and the fun thing about that so is... I love that. Um, you know, we get very regimented and, and um, you have this idea of what you're good at and what you think you should be doing. Believe me, none of this is what I thought I would be doing two years ago when, I mean, I didn't think I would buy one of these microphones or do any of this kind of stuff because I have social anxiety. And, and so of all the things that I was like, oh, I could do this and this would help people. And God's like, wait, I know. <laughs> let's take the thing that scares her the most and let's let her do that. But he's brilliant. Because he's taken somebody with crippling. So, I mean, my biggest battle is the front door. If I can get on the other side of it, I'm okay. I will, I will invariably think of anything I can to not have to get on the other side of that door. It is so anxiety provoking for me. Well, now I've been able to so much work on that kind of anxiety in a safe space by doing videos and, you know, talks and stuff. And now a person with crippling social anxiety is doing a podcast and has her own. And I, you know, who would have seen that coming? God's just, I mean, he's, he's just funny that way. He's like, yeah, watch this. <laughs> I, I would, I would bet money that, uh, that Noah couldn't swim and was afraid of water. I just, I got to think so. I mean, I think there's something, I think there's something else. Maybe that's why, uh, fear is fear and it's, it can't be too easy, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, well, where's it the fun besides it, it anything else? Forces you to change. We want comfort and it's not part of it. you, God is always bringing something new and you, you learn, you have these talents that you didn't know you had. And it's just super cool. I'm like, okay, what are we going to do today? And if you can approach life that way, it is so much more gratifying than, oh, I have to do this today. Um, which we all do. Um, but you know, what, what, what are you going to put in front of me today? I'm watching, what are you going to give me today? And invariably he'll, yeah. he'll do it. Well, I love what you're doing. Um, 
you know, you're so well spoken, you're intelligent, you're hilarious too, by the way. <laughs> so there's, I love the humor in there. So keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. I can't, I'm more, I can't be more thankful for you taking this time. Uh, there's definitely a lot of good information here, amazing story and a lot of lessons. So I'm, I'm proud of what you've become and thank what you, you're baby. doing. And I'm happy to have connected. So I can't thank you again, Penny. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.